time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Carl Hess, press editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Henry Wallace, former Vice President of the United States. Mr. Wallace, I'm sure that our viewers will be glad to see you back for a second appearance on the chronoscope tonight, sir. And Mr. Huey, I'm mighty glad to be here because I look on your program as one of the most constructive on television today. Well, thank you, sir. That's very kind. And tonight, I'm sure that our viewers would like to have uh, some of your observations on uh, what you consider to be the issues of the campaign. <coughs> well, uh, the first one would be, uh, have you made up your mind for whom you're going to vote? Well, it's not exactly an issue of the campaign, and I may say that uh, I've not as yet quite made up my mind. I am going to vote for uh, one of the two leading candidates. Have you felt yourself leaning uh, either way, Mr. Wallace? Well, I'm very carefully refraining from stating publicly as yet as to which way uh, I am leaning. You don't. You I'm don't. Trying to, I'm trying to keep an open mind because uh, I look on myself as a genuine independent. What issues will sway you to lean one way or the other? Uh, the particular issue that would sway me is as to which candidate comes out with the methods which I deem most constructive for promoting a secure peace and domestic prosperity. Well, now, have you, uh, has General Eisenhower, for instance, said anything that interested you along that line? General Eisenhower has said he was for peace. Uh, he hasn't indicated uh, precisely how he would attain a secure peace combined with domestic uh, prosperity. Well, now, you, you described... Now, uh, Stevenson also, uh, I assume, is for peace and domestic prosperity, but neither one nor the other has come out as yet with a definite method of attaining this uh, secure do peace. Do you feel that there's a single definite method? You have something in mind yourself? Yes, I very definitely do have uh, something in mind. Well, sir, you spoke of yourself as being an independent and that you haven't yet made up your mind. Now, do you feel that a great many people haven't yet made up their minds? I think a much larger percentage of the population than usual has not made up its mind as yet. And do you think uh, that, that independence uh, should be in this position now? Do you see independence in some peculiar role in this campaign? I think the independents are important in all campaigns, but especially so in this one. Are they and I hope they, will, I hope they will follow uh, my example and uh, not state exactly how Why? they're going to vote. Why, sir? Because if they will hold their fire as it were, it will be an inducement for both candidates to become more specific, specific in terms of the all important constructive well, well, issues. Can one of the candidates win without making these specific statements? Uh, the, uh, how important are these independents? I think they're unusually important in this particular campaign. I notice uh, Mr. Sam Lubell in one of the New York newspapers has uh, dwelt on that at considerable length and that uh, uh, Elmo Roper has gone into uh, great detail on it. Uh, both Lubell's analysis and Roper's analysis indicate to me quite clearly that well the independents have more importance this year than usual. On this business of smoking them out, sir, uh, what particular plan do you have or what would you like to hear them say? Well, I feel the all-important issue, both from the standpoint of domestic prosperity in the long run and from the standpoint of world peace, is recognizing that in that vast area on the southern border of Russia and China, the dominant problem is an agricultural problem. These people are very poor. They produce, because they produce only about one-fiftieth as much as the American farmer. Uh, their misery has been increasing and the communists are exploiting that misery 
And if those people along that entire southern border, in the desperation of their misery, should succumb to the communist propaganda, then the world would become overbalanced to a very great disadvantage. How many people? You mean India and Iran, that's something like 500 million people in that area, I assume. Oh Canada. yes, definitely 500, going all the way across to northern Africa. And you think that's the, the, the key area at the moment now, the area that Absolutely. We, must, we must fight Russian influence in that area? Yeah, well, I'd put it specifically, that the way to fight Russian influence in that area is really to get close to the people who are on the well, land. You well, see, more than 80% of the people in that area uh, are farmers. And uh, they are 99%, I would say, using uh, backward methods. Well, they're also prisoners of a sort now. How do you get close to them in their condition of servitude to the Soviet Union now? Well, I'm referring to the people on the southern border, the people oh, that below we can reach. China. Yes, it's, uh, it's below China. I'm referring no. to the people in India and uh, Afghanistan and all the way across. Well, does this mean we, fr we give up China? No. I'd say that the way to gain China, the only way in which effectively we can gain China now, is to uh, demonstrate what we can do on the border areas. I do think that the nationalist government in Formosa is putting forth a very good effort at the present time uh, to gain the support of the Formosan farmers. Well, now, with this 500 million people... That is, they, is they do recognize that you have to give the people on the land a stake in the land, something that they feel is their own. In other words, you have uh, uh, 500 million people at least, and 80% of them are farmers, so your particular interest is in four or 500 million uh, farm people and you want to raise their, their living standards. Is that yes, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. I don't say that is the sole issue, but I say that unless that particular issue is recognized, that all other methods of gaining secure, a secure peace for us will fail. And that is, military methods alone can't do it. I, I recognize the need in, in view of Stalin's uh, statement, uh, I think it was October 14th, just yeah. a few days ago, uh, means that uh, we do have to be fully prepared for every contingency. Uh, you may remember the precise uh, statement, it was something to the effect that, that uh, Russia was standing behind uh, the communists in every Western country. How do you interpret that? Well, it was a very alarming statement because uh, it would indicate that at the moment, uh, uh, Stalin, uh, Stalin uh, believes that there is going to be war and he wants to have a fifth column in every Western well, country. That, uh, I, I do hope that Stalin uh, comes to his senses and abandons that position because that does seem to foreclose peace at the moment. Is that rather disillusioning to you, sir? You've been uh, friendly toward uh, the Soviet Union at, at various periods in your life, haven't well, you? Well, I, I have felt that the dominant issue ever since uh, 1942 uh, that the dominant post-war issue would be whether or not we could come to a friendly understanding with Russia. I still say it's the dominant issue, and I regret exceedingly that uh, uh, that uh, Stalin has made a statement of this sort and that Russia has been taking an attitude that seems to make peace uh, very difficult. Well, to come back to your, your plan, sir, for helping to raise the, the food standard of these people, uh, uh, Stalin's plan, isn't it, as you understand it now, is to help, to st is to try to destroy us by inflation is one of the things, one of the weapons against us, isn't it? Well, that's what this statement would indicate. Well, see, I felt right along that, uh, uh, that the uh, Stalinist Marxists, uh, uh, being so steeped in their brand of economics, would try to uh, destroy us without war, either by the deflation route or the inflation route. No, and it's inflation. And this statement would indicate to me that they feel the best bet is the inflation route, maintaining the tension at the maximum so that we will uh, spend vast sums of money on armaments. Well, how can we go about uh, raising the living standards of four or five hundred million farmers without uh, increasing the dangers of inflation at home? Uh, I think the uh, pattern for doing that is given by Nelson Rockefeller's uh, program uh, through this International Agricultural uh, Corporation in Brazil and Venezuela, which uh, means that you use technicians, uh, American and native technicians, working hand in hand, 
using local money as much as possible to make supervised loans to the local farmers. Now that doesn't take an awful lot of either U.S. capital or United Nations capital, uh, but it does take a lot of training of both American technicians and the native technicians to do the job. I know something about this kind of thing because I saw, the, saw it work in the old Farm Security Administration. The supervised loans for farmers does not, that method does not need to take an awful lot of money. Is it fair to describe well, I what... Would, I would hope that yes. General Eisen, if he becomes president, that his brother Milton would be there at his right hand because he knows exactly how this is done. And if Stevenson becomes president, I could, I could name certain people that uh, could help him. <laughs> well, well, in this case, though, uh, your aid program, it seems to me, would run smack into a Russian uh, barrier of actual sabotage and certainly of propaganda. How do we overcome that? Well, of course, uh, you can meet propaganda with propaganda, but the best way of meeting propaganda of all is to produce results. And I think our extension people know how it is that you produce actual results and getting them to produce twice as much as they've been producing. Well, then this <coughs> isn't exactly a struggle for men's minds at this point. It's a struggle first for men's stomachs and through the stomachs their minds. As We've got to get their stomachs because there's a population explosion coming out the mouths out running the food. And unless we recognize that, there's the direst disaster coming to all of us, including Russia, I may say. Well, I, I uh, as, as, as one of the world's uh, great food scientists, sir, then, as I understand it, you think that we are specific, very particularly well equipped uh, to fight this battle for there's men's There's no stomachs. nation so well equipped. The communists can use propaganda and make promises which they can never fulfill about giving the land to them and this, that, and the other thing but uh, we are the ones that can produce results. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Carl Hess. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Henry Wallace, former Vice President of the United States. Consistently superior manufacture makes Longines the world's most honored watch. Never in its 86 years of business has Longines deviated from its policy of making the finest quality of watch and only the finest. As a result, at world's fairs and international expositions, in competition with the world's finest timepieces, Longines watches have consistently won highest honors, including 10 world's fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards. And in competitive accuracy trials at great government observatories, Longines watches have been equally successful. In view of Longines' demonstrated superiority, isn't it remarkable that a Longines watch can be purchased for as little as $71.50? So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, remember that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. And you should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that your mark as an American is X on the ballot. Vote for whom you please, but please vote. Sunday nights, the web spins mystery on the CBS television network.